All right, thanks. Thanks, Vince. So back up a little, uh, a little bit here for these slides. Uh, so this is, this is a joint meeting. Uh, I have so many logos here. I feel a bit like a NASCAR driver. But uh, it's a meeting between uh, National Institute for Computational Sciences, Exceed, NSF, Nimbus, and the Knoxville Our Users Group. Uh, the way the structure of the tutorial is going to break down is it's, it's four modules, and we'll have about 45 minutes of instruction, and then 15 minutes for exercises. After the second module, it's 30 minutes exercises plus break, and then no, no time at the end for exercises, although um, they are available to you. Where could you find those exercises, as well as these slides? Uh, the URL that we've been managing everything uh, from, which happens to be this URL right here, nimbus.org slash tutorials slash tt underscore r for HPC. If you go there, you can find the slides, you can find the exercises, and anything else that you should need uh, for this tutorial. So the URL that you've been using um, for registration and, and uh, for those who are watching live, uh, or uh, watching remotely, um, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the URL you use to actually get to the live feed. So we want to introduce you to some pretty broad things, right? We don't want to just leap onto, you know, thousands of nodes of a supercomputer. Uh, we're going to talk about basic debugging in R, uh, evaluating performance of R code, uh, benchmarking, profiling, uh, some best practices for R code, exporting some computationally intensive kernels to compiled code, C and C++, uh, as well as parallelism. Uh, whoop. So for the exercises, I just want to make a note here at the beginning. I've offered more exercises than you reasonably have time to complete. That's intentional. Some people will find some of the exercises more boring than others. So if you don't like one, skip it. Uh, and hopefully there will be a couple there that you will enjoy. If you think all of them are great, of course, you can use you know, extra time uh, to complete them. Uh, they generally get harder as you go down the list. That's not strictly true, but I, in my opinion, that's mostly true. Um, some of the exercises are not just copy-paste from the slides. Some are. Um, if, if you feel like not enough information was given to you, it may be by design. You may have to go back through the slides and find a reference somewhere. Um, so just a few notes. And hop back through these. It may take a second. Oh, here we go. Okay. So let's begin. Uh, we're going to start with a five-minute introduction to R. Let's see if I can stick, stick to five minutes on this. Uh, five-minute introduction to R. So R has a couple of basic types. R has logical. I say, log uh, I say Boolean in quotes. I'll expand on that in a second. But it has logical, has integer. For R, that means 32-bit integer. Um, numeric, which means double precision. Complex, which is sort of like double complex uh, and then what they call character, which are really strings. So um, if you are working in R, here's an R session. Hopefully everybody can kind of see that. So if you're working in R, um, you know, you might, uh, how, how, would you, how would you name something, right? It's one of the questions we get asked a lot. R has naming rules sort of similar to C. So you would start with, uh, say, a letter, and then you know, maybe underscore two or something. You can also use dot, right, which you couldn't do in C. And so what I generally tell people is that uh, the naming rules are basically like those of C. This is actually a, a horrible lie. You can name an R object anything you want. All right, so you can name an R object absolutely crazy things. You can use Unicode to name R objects. You can program in emojis if that's what you want to do. Uh, isn't that exciting? So, um, what about what about uh, this logical? So I said I said R had logical, and then I put boolean in quotes. Why would I say that? Because uh, it's not really boolean. There's true, there's false, and there's na. So the type of na is logical. In fact, there are many nas. There's a character in A, an integer, a complex, a real, but also logical. Um, there's also these little bindings T and F. These are sort of shorthand for true and false. Uh, however, they are reassignable. And so uh, if you want to celebrate opposite day, 
you can, you can set T to false, you can set F to true, and then uh, enjoy this kind of madness. Um, what, about, what about structures, right? So we have vectors, we have no scalars, in fact. So when I say X is 1, that's actually a vector of length 1. It's not a scalar. Scalars just don't exist. Um, maybe we'll instead look at this thing. So if I say x is the uh, vector containing elements 1, 2, then look at x. Uh, it's, it's those two elements, right? So we index with brackets like that. So if I say uh, x element 1, it's going to give me the first element. If I said x element 2, it'll give me the second. We know in modern programming languages that when you step outside the bounds of an array, it throws an error. So in R, of course, it returns in A. Uh, so that's interesting. What if we look at x0? Arrays, or uh, vectors if you like, in R are 1 indexed, as opposed to in C where they are 0 indexed. So if I look at x0, what do we get, do you think? So when we went, when we said x3, we got in A. When we say x0, we get, of course, the empty vector. Uh, what about negative uh, indices, right? If you look at x negative 1, we're outside the bounds, sort of. What do you think that's going to give us? It's, it's going to give us 2, right? Because that's kicking out the first element. This is very unusual if you've worked with another programming language. This is all very, very unusual. Uh, so here's another example. Uh, I wrote a C library. Okay? I put this library into an R package. I then installed the R package into an R library. And in R, you load packages with the library command. I mean, this is an insane language, right? This is crazy. This is madness. And that's why it's my favorite language. Uh, I think R is a really beautiful language. Um, this is my, maybe my favorite quote about R. R is a shockingly dreadful language for an exceptionally useful data analysis environment. And I don't think any other person has summed up R quite so accurately or eloquently as uh, this person here. This comes from ARG, a new uh, comer's angry guide to R. I highly recommend this. It's, uh, it's great reading, very entertaining. Uh, but it's a strange language, right? Computer scientists hate it, can't stand it. Why, um, why even talk about it, right? Well, it's, it's crazy popular. This is a ranking of programming languages from the IEEE, okay? And you see R is number nine. And again, I would emphasize this is a ranking of programming languages, not analysis packages. When you look at that kind of ranking, R comes out number one, generally. Uh, so this is, uh, this is the Rex Analytics Data Miner Survey. Uh, R was the number one used tool. This is from 2013. I think they do it every other year. A new one should be coming out uh, relatively soon, I think. Uh, so this may be the worst programming language you've ever heard of, but you have heard of it, right? <laughs> so um, why use R at all? There are many reasons. Uh, I'm going to claim that R has the most diverse set of analysis, uh, statistical analysis, data analysis methods available, that nothing else really compares to it. When people publish a paper about statistics, analytics, data science, they often, with the paper, will publish an R package, right? Or even people who just don't even care about papers are just cranking out, turning out R packages all day. Uh, R enables very rapid prototyping. R comes from, or inherits, uh, some elements from Scheme, uh, which is a very, um, uh, very friendly language for expression, let's say. And R enjoys that same friendliness for expression. So um, if you're coming from a language like Python, R may seem absolutely off the wall crazy. But if you're just thinking about how to express an idea and make the computer do its job, R is actually really great. It has a really great community. Uh, I've hit on a couple of times. And the thing I always like to point out is the syntax for R is designed for the analysis of data. That's not true of, uh, that's not true of Julia, a language that I'm really rooting for. That's not true of Python. It's not true of MATLAB. R syntax was designed for the analysis of data. And so it excels there. It doesn't mean it doesn't have problems, but um, it, is, it is good at what it is designed to do. So here are some R resources for you if you are um, if you're coming from another background uh, and just sort of getting into R now, 
Uh, this one here is the one that I recommend the most if you are willing to pay for an actual uh, book. Uh, it's Art of Our Programming by Norm Matloff. I've said this many times. It's the book I wish I had had when I was first learning programming. It's, it's uh, our, well, our programming. It's fantastic. I uh, really recommend it. Uh, these are some other free resources. They're very good. ARG is, is a very entertaining read. Um, again, this, this is great, but it costs money. Uh, these are free. You can, you can go through those, and if you like it, great. If you don't, uh, that's fine. Some other invaluable resources. The R Installation and Administration Guide is very useful. R has a bunch of task views for extra packages. So if you want to know uh, how do you do network analysis in R, well, you can go see the 100 different packages that do just that uh, through the task views. Uh, the mailing list is very useful. So there are several mailing lists for R. Uh, the Stack Overflow tag, uh, R, is very useful. And also on Twitter, the RStats hashtag, we're all very friendly people on there. Uh, so if you have a question, you'll probably get an answer, and it may be from like some really big famous person in the R community. Uh, you know, you have a question about a package, and the author will tell you <laughs> what you're doing wrong. It's, it's pretty nice. Uh, so we're very friendly people. We like uh, we like collaboration, and we like helping people. So I would really not overlook that. It's it's a really really useful part uh, of of learning and dealing with R. Okay, so that's the introduction. Um, R is more data analysis package than programming language is another way to sum up what I have been arguing. Uh, you can't really deny R's popularity even if you don't like R. I happen to love it, but um, it, is, it is a unique language, certainly. Okay, so we're going to start talking about debugging. So debugging is a very important topic, very near, very dear to my heart. Um, tends to get glossed over in these kinds of these kinds of trainings, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot that you could say. It's, a, it's an extremely broad topic. We're going to hit some highlights. And we've sort of already hit a few. I've shown you some of the bizarre things about R, if you're thinking of R as a programming language. Um, how, you know, when you run into those, how are you going to know how to help yourself fix those problems? So here, we hope to illuminate uh, some of those ways. We're, as I said, I could talk for a very long time about just debugging in R. Um, you could almost make a, a university course out of it. But uh, we're just going to hit the highlights. And if you want some other examples, this is a really great read. It's from the uh, Writing R Extensions Manual, an invaluable resource for dealing with R. Um, so R has some object inspection tools, as you might expect. right? It has print. Although the default thing to do in R is to print anyway. We saw that before, right? When I just typed, you know, when I just typed a thing, it printed the thing, right? So by default, R is just going to print stuff. Um, but you can also use the print function. Uh, there are some other uh, print formatting tools like sprintf and cat. Um, there's stir, which is one of the most useful functions in all of R. Stir is uh, to examine the structure of an object. Uh, unclass is a little more specialized, but very useful. And I'll show you how that works. But uh, it's an extremely useful function, in my opinion. So basic printing, OK? I'm going to construct this matrix. So I say x is matrix, elements 1 to 10, in rows is 2. And then I'm going to look at it, OK? Do you notice anything about, uh, about the elements of that matrix? It's, it should be elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, how are they filling? They're filling by column, right? So matrices in R are, are, are column major, as opposed to many other places where it would 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You know, um, in MATLAB, I think MATLAB is, is row major. Um, Python probably is. I don't remember. Well, R is column major, like Fortran. Um, and there are actually reasons for this that, that go back to the origins of the language itself. Um, so I can print x, or I can just type x, and it will show me the object, right? We can also examine the structure of the object using str. So if I say str of x, it's going to give me the type. So those are integers. It's going to say uh, 1 to 2, 1 to 5. It's really basically just giving me the dimensions. And then it's going to name the first 10 elements in that substructure. So if there had been an 11th, it would have said dot, dot, dot there, basically. 
And if this had been a much more complicated structure, it would have, it would have just printed a lot more of these things. And we'll show you an example. Okay. Uh, unclass, as I said, is a little more specialized, but is very useful. And, I, and I'm going to show you why it's useful. It's useful for exposing um, things that people have hidden from you. So in R, when you, when you run an analysis, say a linear model, the output of that linear model uh, is, is an object in the object-oriented sense. And there's a special print method assigned to it. So it's only going to print very little of the information that is actually stored in that object. If you want to see what the object really looks like, you can use uh, str to look at the structure of it. But if I want to see literally everything, then I can use unclass. So let's try this. What we're doing here, we're going to make a data frame. Data frame is like a matrix, but the columns can be different types of things. And it's just going to have some random data. We're going to fit a linear model, LM of Y, that's a tilde or a twiddle, uh, X. Data is DF, store the model. We're going to print it. We're going to see that we can't see all the stuff that's there. We'll look at the structure, and then we'll look at absolutely everything that's stored there. So... So we can look at the data frame. It's just some random data. So now I'm going to fit my model. OK. And now I'm going to clear the screen. But if I look at the model, it's going to tell me what the call was, what the formula was. And it's going to give me uh, some coefficient information. There's a lot more stuff stored there. Uh, if I try to print it, it's just going to give me the same thing back. Really, I want to know what's all the stuff that's stored in there. So I can look at the structure, and a whole bunch of stuff just scroll by. right? You may want to do this locally on your, your machine to really get a sense for all the stuff here. But I mean, there's all kinds of stuff stored here. right? This is a very complicated object. And it's only just printing that, that little bit of information. But all that stuff is there. So do we see any dot, dot, dots anywhere? Yeah, we do. So uh, so here, right, we see some of, the, some of the characters are being suppressed. So I want to see all of it. I want to see all of that information. To do that, I can use unclass. And then, bam, it's going to give me, we can see, scroll back. So we see it's storing coefficients, residuals, the effects, uh, the rank. Uh, so um, the, the numerical rank of the columns. Uh, fitted values, uh, I forget what a sign is, the QR. So this does it by QR decomposition, and it stores the QR information. Uh, this QRUX is some nonsense from LA Pack, not worth getting into. Uh, pivot is, well, were any columns ranked degenerate, and did they have to swap around? Here they didn't. The tolerance for, for the swapping of those columns, all kinds of stuff is stored in here, right? And you wouldn't know it if you just tried to print, if I can type, if you just tried to print model, right, you wouldn't know it. So uh, I am a big fan of unclass. I think it is underappreciated. Uh, it's a very useful inspection tool. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Um, R also has a very powerful debugger. How does it work? Uh, there's actually a lot to R's debugger. Uh, the way I describe it to people coming from other languages is it's it's like it's everything you would ever want uh, GDB to be. Uh, it's much nicer than working with something like GDB, in my opinion. The way it works is you call debug on a function. In R, functions are first class objects. So, you know, I don't put the function in quotes or anything like that. I just give it the function. And we'll show you an example. Uh, I can also just debug once if I don't want to debug every single time that function is evaluated. Or if I'm using debug, and I want to stop debugging, I undebug. That's basically the principle. How do you interact with it? Once you uh, declare the function foo, let's say, to be debugged, you would just call debug foo to do that. Once you do that, you evaluate foo at whatever its arguments are, arg1, 2, whatever. And now you're inside the debugger. So this is, a, this is an important point, and it's, it's one of the only things I don't like about the debugger. If you hit enter, it'll go to the next line. Or if you hit in, enter. Why is this annoying? Very often we have variables named in, and the default thing is normally to print. 
So if I want to look at the value of n, I might, not thinking too hard, say n enter and go to the next line, rather than see the actual value stored for n. Uh, this is a source of frustration for me, but this is just the way it works, and it's probably to model debuggers like GDB. Um, you can stop execution and leave the debugger with Q, uh, capital Q enter. You can continue execution. C is another thing from R uh, that if you did C enter, you might uh, not realize what it's going to do. It will continue execution and exit the debugger. And then undebug, as I said, will stop debugging, undebug foo, will stop debugging future calls of foo. So here's, here's a non-live example. Okay, how does this work? I'm going to say f is the function, so we're defining a function. It has a single argument x, and what is it going to do? It's going to take z plus 1 and store it for y, and then I'm going to say z is y times 2, and then print the value of z. So what I'm thinking as I'm producing an example to try to, to very simply explain debugging is uh, this should have been an x, right? You follow my, my train of reasoning for the purposes of demonstration? Uh, it, it's really hard to come up with a good <laughs> example to, d to show off debugging uh, without either being too trivial or, or hard to understand what's happening, I, I feel. Hopefully this is clear, my intentions are clear. So if I say f of 1, error, z not found, right? Why was z not found? So I can debug f. I can also, by the way, here's another cute thing about r. Uh, whoops, I can't highlight, that's fine. Uh, what was it, y plus 1, or x, hang on. What did I do? What did I do? <laughs> z plus 1, y times 2. Okay, I'm losing my mind. And then we return z. Okay. So I can just f, if I just look at f, it's just going to print the, the R-level source code for it. Right? The default thing to do is print. And so if I want to look at this object, functions are first class objects, it's just going to print the source. Right? So um, I can just show you live. So if we want to debug f, and I call f of 1, we're now debugging. So we see the prompt has changed from a little arrow to browse, and then the level of the call stack. Um, so you can debug inside of a debug, debug function, right? You can, you can debug, and then there's some function call. Well, I want to debug that inside of the thing I'm already debugging. That's totally cool. It's just going to hop to a new level. Uh, so when I press enter, it's going to tell me that we want to evaluate y is z plus 1, right? I can look at what's available to me. The only thing available to me is x. So there is no object z, and so when I hit enter and it gives the error, I can understand what went wrong, right? Just a simple example. Um, okay, so debugging compiled code that is called by R is a little more tricky, but is possible. Uh, I say it's reasonably easy to use GDB. Uh, it's very easy to use Valgrind if you're calling compiled code. This will be important because module three is going to be talking about how to integrate compiled code into R. So I really want to hit this highlight, even though you may feel, oh, I'll never do that. It turns out to be pretty easy to integrate compiled code to R. So you may one day need these tools. Uh, GDB is a general purpose debugger from GNU. Um, you can probably use the same strategy for GDB with LLDB. I've never tried. Probably even with the Intel stuff, I've never tried. I always use GDB. Um, GDB is a debugger in the sense of like the R level debugger. Valgrind is a memory debugger. And if you're working in C and C++, it's the greatest thing to exist. So it'll help you catch your memory leaks. It's really, really, really nice. Um, for GDB, you can work interactively. Uh, Valgrind, you'll run things in batch. And how this works is, if you have, this is, this is gonna be a little convoluted, but bear with me. If you have uh, R function, foo r, and this calls the c function, foo c, or c++ function, right? Uh, we want to debug foo c with gdb. How are we going to do that? This is the set of things that you need to do, and it looks all very strange because gdb is weird and has all these strange things that uh, look bizarre. Uh, and so that's how you would use gdb. 
won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can do it. Uh, Valgrind, you basically just run this giant thing on your script, and it will, it will run through and do uh, memory profiling for you. Very, 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 very useful. Um, I once submitted a package to CRAN, and had I run Valgrind on that package first, I wouldn't have gotten a very angry email from the CRAN. So I highly recommend Valgrind. It's a very, very useful tool. So quick summary, R has very sophisticated tools for debugging. Um, debug, stir, uh, the underappreciated on class. GDB use is possible, but a little awkward. GDB itself, in my opinion, is a little awkward, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's the standard. Valgrind is very straightforward to use. Uh, I think Valgrind may only be available on Linux and Mac. That may be the case. May not be available on Windows. Uh, I'm not sure. But um, Valgrind's great. I love it. Okay, uh, any questions before we move on to profiling? Anything from Twitter? No. All right. There are a couple people with some tech issues. Okay. Everybody's talking about how excited they are. And You're lying. <laughs> no, seriously. We got like at 4 a.m. here in Australia and I'm just Oh, oh. <laughs> well. Uh, I, I will say uh, the, the response to this has been, been very exciting and very humbling, and we're, we're very grateful for everybody local and remote who, who's uh, participating in this. Um, I really do mean that sincerely. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about profiling. Okay. Profiling is, 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 is the quickest way to my heart. Profiling is so important to me. Um, a lot of what I do is I, I reach out to other, other folks who are doing their own thing, and it's slow, or it's not really working right, and they don't know why. And um, if I ask them, you know, do you know, they give me the code, and they say, have at it. And if I say, well, do you know where I should start looking? The answers that I get usually are no idea at all, or yeah, go look at this function, and it's not even close to their bottleneck, right? You don't have to guess. R has very sophisticated tools for profiling, right? And... Um, this is, this is a great quote. This is from Linus Torvalds, and I really love this. There's a very smug Linus Torvalds telling us that uh, sometimes Python 3.14 is infinitely faster than the correct answer. The difference between the correct and the so-called wrong answer is meaningless, and uh, performance almost always matters. I absolutely detest the fact that people so often dismiss performance concerns so readily. I couldn't possibly agree more. So how are you going to find your performance concerns? By profiling. So I, I argue that in the R community in particular, we should be profiling our code, figuring out our bottlenecks, speeding them up if, we, up if we can. Why? Performance matters. Bad practices scale up. So you think, ah, oh, we'll just make everything parallel. It's going to be great, right? Uh, well, you could make it even greater, maybe, um, before you go parallel, which is not always cheap and, cheap and easy. Um, uh, your bottlenecks may surprise you. R is really dumb. This will be... Uh, this will be something repeated throughout uh, today's, today's uh, uh, tutorial. And my, my last one is, all right, your data people, right? Act like it. Look at your data. Profile your code. Figure out what your bottlenecks are. R is dumb. What do I mean when I say R is dumb? This is some C code. We don't really need to understand what it does, OK? Uh, well, let me back up. What it does is we go through uh, for i equals 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We're going to set the integer x to value 1 and then quit. Okay? Why would you do that? You could just set x to 1 once and then quit, right? If we look here, this is the generated assembly from Clang. We don't have to understand what this means. It doesn't matter. This is the generated assembly with optimization enabled. Okay? We don't need to know what it means. Do you notice a difference between these two things? Right? The compiler is making some very aggressive changes to my code. R will do no such thing. So here's an example. This is fabricated, uh, but it's a, it's a nice example because I see things like this in the wild. So you have a loop, and we're going to say, well, I really want to store the transpose because I'm going to need it later. But then you set, I'm not saying you, but then somebody sets the transpose storage inside of the loop. If you do that, Notice we're not updating the transpose. We're not updating A. So this TA is constant as far as this loop is concerned, right? So 
each iteration, R is not going to do the clever thing and fix my code. R is going to do the dumb thing and update TA even though it doesn't need updating. We've made a bad choice. It would be better to move it out front of the loop and you only do it once and you're not burning all of these memory operations, okay? Which can be very expensive. You know, if A is a very large matrix, you have just destroyed the performance of your code for no good reason, right? Um, here's a real example. This actually happened. I was looking up some, some packages on the CRAN for doing a, um, a certain kind of analysis that was relevant to um, clustering in the biological sciences. I don't exactly remember the context, but uh, I saw a package I thought was really interesting. And I installed it, I ran the demos, and the demos took a really long time to run. I thought, wow, how big is the data set he's packaged, he or she has packaged with uh, this package? And I look at the data set, it's tiny. It's, it's, it's trivial in size. So I'm like, all right, something's wrong here. What did I do? I run it through R's profiler, which I will introduce to you in a moment. As soon as I did, I saw something that just stared out. It, it just is glaring me in the face. This is wrong. Don't do this. Why? There's this complicated object X. And I've sort of removed some context that would make this more obvious to you. But for, for, for the sake of time, X is this sort of complicated uh, object. They wanted it cast as a matrix to do some things to, and X was not updated. That cast was very expensive. I changed one line of code and improved the main bottleneck of this guy's uh, package, or gal's package, by 350%. I emailed them, they didn't care, whatever. But um, it's, uh, it's, important, it's important to think about these kinds of things, right? Um, you know, I didn't drop to compile code. This isn't parallelism. This isn't anything fancy or complicated or clever. I'm just being a little bit cautious and improving the performance 350%, right? And it took me 10 minutes, not an exaggeration. So um, R is very slow. Bad programmers with R are slower. R can't fix bad programming. So because of all of these things, we need to be very concerned about profiling R code. How do you do it? There are a few tools that I will recommend. There are actually even more, but these are the highlights. Again, this, this whole thing is going to be uh, broad, broad strokes. Um, so we can do system.time if you just want to do a simple single timing, single execution timing. There's rprof, which is, which is my baby. I love rprof. Uh, and this is like a line profiler. We'll show you how this works. rprof mem is a little more complicated. We won't show you how this works. But if, if you have a lot of memory bottlenecks, you might look into rprof mem. rprof itself has some, some other options for memory profiling. It's a little more advanced than I want to get into. There's also trace mem, which used to be really important. Now is less important. It can detect, so you say like trace mem of an object x, and then you run a bunch of stuff that uses x, and it'll tell you when a copy uh, was created. R's gotten a lot better about not making uh, bad copies, so it's a lot less useful today, but it's interesting. So system.time, it's a very basic uh, timer. So here, we're just going to have a random uh, a matrix of just some random normal data. It'll have 20,000 rows, 750 columns. And I'm going to do two operations. I'm going to do two of t of x, so transpose, times x. And it took about 2.324 seconds. I can also time cross prod x. It took considerably less time. They do the exact same thing, by the way. Uh, and then I can look at Cove x, which is related to these but does considerably more, and as we see, takes a very long time. Although you can actually increase the, the performance of this significantly. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll not get into that, maybe. So these are just simple, simple timings, right? Um, if you have more complicated expressions than like a single evaluation, you can put them in brackets. So if I want to time, um, I have this matrix x, I'm going to add one to it store it as y, and then I'm going to multiply it by 2. I don't recommend you do things this way, but for the sake of demonstration, this is a slightly more complicated set of expressions than just like single function evaluation. Um, so here I can put them in brackets, multi-line statements, and it, it'll time. Pretty simple, right? Rprof, okay? I really, really, really love Rprof. Uh, why is Rprof useful? Rprof is going to give you line profilings. So, System.time can only tell you 
the whole thing, whatever it was doing, who knows, took this much time, right? It doesn't tell you what your bottleneck within that evaluation was. Our prof will tell you <laughs> what your bottleneck was. And um, profiling like this is, is an interesting problem if you've never thought about it. Uh, it's an interesting problem in the sense that uh, how, you know, how are you going to measure performance of something without changing the performance of it, right? Whenever you measure performance of, of some code, you're going to change the performance of that code. So how do you do it? Our prof has an interesting, interesting solution, so they use sampling and it turns out to work really well. So basically they sample the call stack every 0.02 seconds, and there's a bunch of other options we won't get into. Um, how does it work? Okay. I'm going to create another matrix. It'll be a little smaller. It'll have 10,000 rows, 250 columns. Okay. So I'm going to call rprof, then prcomp, this invisible means I just, I don't care what the result is, don't show it to me. It would, it would just print a bunch of stuff to the terminal, don't show it. Uh, so PR comp is principal components, and then I call R prof null to stop profiling. In the original call, I can also put, um, I can also put like a, a file that I want to sync the profiling data to, and then I can call summary R prof. Summary R prof is going to summarize the data that R prof is storing, and then after we run that, we're going to run another one where I set the sampling interval to 0.99 and redo the exact same thing. And we'll see what that output is. So I, I do suggest you run this yourself. Um, you, can, you can make this a little smaller. But I do suggest you run this yourself to see what it will do. This is the first one. The first one here, right? rprof, no arguments, prcomp, rprof null. Summary rprof is going to give all of this. And I've actually suppressed a lot of the output. So most of the time is in this function la.svd. We could look up. It's a singular value decomposition. Probably not surprising. Then a matrix matrix product. A perm default. I don't even know what that is. Uh, array matrix sweep. Um, uh, oh, so this is, this is by self. Here's by total time. It'll also arrange for you. Very, very useful function. It tells you exactly which R functions um, in maybe some very complicated uh, function call it tells you which R functions are gobbling up all of the compute time, or wall clock time. Uh, if we called it again with interval equal 0.99, we would get nothing, right? Why? Nothing showed up inside of that interval. And in fact, we can see the, the sampling time it ran for like 0.98 seconds. So if we run it again, inside of the interval of our interest here, nothing, uh, nothing showed up, right? So that's a, that's a very extreme way to, to show you. You can control... Um, you can control how trivial a function execution you are interested in seeing, right? If it takes very little time, you can control uh, with, the, with this interval argument, you can control how likely those things are to show up. Very, very, very useful uh, utility. A couple quick things here before we get to the exercises. Sure. And I didn't quite catch the, the difference between by, uh, by itself and by total. Okay. So, it's a great question. Uh, what's the difference between by self and by total? If I don't repeat the question, please, please remind me uh, for, for the folks who are remote, for their sake. Um, I've lost my train of thought. So, uh, uh, the, the difference between by self and by total. So, uh, if we look at, if we want to display the total time used, okay, the call was, oops, the call was PR comp, right? And so the total time is, is actually 0.98 seconds. So PR comp, the whole thing, ran for 0.98 seconds. Within PR comp, there was this execution of a function PR comp dot default, because there are these different PR comps if you give it a data frame or a matrix or whatever. So that's the next one, right? And it took 0.98 seconds. So that's not, that's not cumulative. It's total 0.98, and then within that, this was the next biggest function call. Within that, the next biggest function call was a call to SVD. And uh, that is, um, uh, the, 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 the next biggest is by LASVD. Here, we're looking at which of the individual components simply took the most time. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, that may not have been a great explanation, but we can we can one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so, very quickly, a couple of quick profiling tools. 
Uh, there's perf and pappy, fpmpi, mpipe, tau for MPI profiling, and then a couple of packages uh, that I am one of the developers of that I'll hit some highlights on. So these are advanced tools. You have more advanced questions than line profiling. What would you do? If you're interested in MPI profiling, so you're using MPI code, and you want to understand your bottlenecks in MPI, we have a package, pvdprof. This shows you um, how you can use it. And we also have the ability to generate some very nice plots and displays that will show you, you know, uh, here I, I think this was just a, a garbage function, but a bunch of sends and receives. You can see what's dominating uh, the, the network, basically. PVD Pappy is a little newer. So Pappy is this tool developed basically right down the hall. And um, it's, it's a tool for getting performance counter data. So things like cache misses and flops, uh, and we have a first class uh, interface to Pappy for R, so you can get the number of uh, floating point instructions, operations, cache misses, hits, accesses, reads. Um, <clears throat> you can characterize something as CPU or RAM bound, depending on what you mean by that statement. Um, so if, for example, if I just generate uh, 1 times 10 to the 5 random normal elements and look at how many cache misses that generates, uh, it's a whole lot of L1 cache misses a whole lot of L2 and some L3, okay? I can also plot it. So if I say plot X, it will generate a plot that looks like this. And we also have utilities for dealing with multiple objects. So if I now have Y, so this is 5 times 10 to the 5 random normals, and I say plot X, Y, then on a common axis, it'll plot that here was 1 times 10 to the 5, here's 5 times 10 to the 5, those are the cache misses. You can get a sense for comparing two functions, which one's doing better or worse. Uh, and then here's some, some information if that sounds interesting to you. Uh, there we have a guide. We have a couple of blog posts about it. Uh, it's a really handy function. I've actually discovered some very interesting information with PVD Pappy. Um, but a quick summary, always, 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 always profile. You will be, you will be shocked sometimes at what your bottlenecks are. Um, System.time can get a general sense for how long something is taking. Our prof is for more detailed profiling. And then we have some other utilities as well. Now, uh, we have 15 minutes for questions and exercises. Uh, you should have access to the exercises. Um, the last section of the part one exercises is about benchmarking. Just with, with introductions and stuff, I knew that would have to be pushed into the next section. So you can just ignore that for now. But all the other exercises, take a look. Um, and I will be... I'll be around to answer any questions, either from folks who are here locally or remote folks. So have a look. <laughs>